So welcome everyone uh, to our interdisciplinary conversation on integrating arts into the curriculum. Uh, I'm just going to wait a minute just because uh, I think people are still trickling in. We'll just wait another minute more. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that musical introduction from Yo-Yo Ma playing the prelude to the Bark cello suite in G. And what I thought was particularly nice about it was that it really gave a sense of the variety of arts and not just music. So we saw lots of different uh, interaction uh, of arts um, as, as we went through that beautiful piece. So yeah, so welcome folks. I think we'll wait just one more minute. Uh, nice to see everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're looking forward to the conversation today. Okay, so folks, I just want to let you know that we are recording this event so that people who are not here can watch or listen to it later. So my name is uh, Dr. Deb Breen. I'm the Director for the Center for Teaching and Learning here at Boston University. We are offering visual as well as verbal introductions today. So to round out my own introduction, I am a white woman who uses she, her pronouns. I have hair that used to be categorically red, um, but it's kind of fading to a, a color that's a little hard to describe right now. Um, I'm in my study at the moment, which has a bright blue wall behind me. So folks, thank you for being here. We are just doing the introductions at the moment. So we would also like to situate our event today with an acknowledgement of the land in which we are virtually meeting. So I respectfully acknowledge that we gather here today on the territory of the many indigenous Massachusetts peoples who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. I pay respect to the Massachusetts elders, past, present and emerging. I acknowledge the truth of violence perpetrated in the name of this country including the erasure of Indigenous people's histories. When I say these words, I'm aware of the incredible and damaging weight of history that continues to impact our broader society today, not only here, but in other colonised countries. But nonetheless, I believe that land acknowledgements are a small but important step towards building a culture of respect, truth and accountability. In framing today's meeting with this statement, I continue to reflect on how principles of equity, diversity and inclusion are essential components of everything that we do. So it's over 60 years since the British scientist and novelist C.P. Snow wrote his famous essay on two cultures, noting the growing separation between the arts and sciences as two fundamental areas of human inquiry. So we're not here today to explore that specific divide although I think it does actually influence our thinking a little, and it hasn't grown less over time. But we are here to think about how the arts, whether we think of that term as covering literature, music, visual arts, dance, or many other creative forms. So how the arts can be part of our teaching practice across all of our disciplines. And we have three speakers today who are gonna present their perspectives on that question. But before going into the specifics of our program, I'd like to invite Ty Foreman, the director of the BU Arts Initiative, to give some opening comments as well. Thanks, Ty. Thank you very much, Deb. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to echo Deb's welcome and thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Ty Furman. I am the managing director of the BU Arts Initiative. I use he, him pronouns. I am a 52 year old white male with dirty blonde hair and short facial hair wearing a blue button down shirt with an art uh, installation image behind me today. Um, and we are thrilled to co-sponsor this program. Um, this uh, conversation really is what we hope it will be um, around integrating the arts into the curriculum. Um, we know sometimes that's a scary endeavor um, maybe unfamiliar territory, but I think the three folks we have here to talk to you um, will um, share some uh, exciting projects that they have worked on and some ways in which they approach this work. So on behalf of the BU Arts Initiative, thank you for being here. Back to you, Deb. 
Okay, thanks Ty. So I'm looking forward to our three presentations today, uh, both uh, in their own right, but also as ways of getting into this conversation. So each speaker will present their perspectives and practice for about 10 minutes, um, but we'll allow, we're going to you know, um, take questions um, if, you, if you feel you have a question while they are speaking, please feel free to put it in the chat or raise your virtual hand and we will find a way to uh, alert the, each speaker of those questions. Um, and then at the end of all of the presentations, we'll also have time for an open um, discussion. So question and answer or conversation between all the participants. Um, please remember to mute yourself when you are not speaking. And I think with that, we can get underway. So our first presenter today is Jennifer Beard. Jen is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Public Health within the School of Public Health and the associate editor of Public Health Post. She will speak about using fiction in a global mental health class as a way to spark conversations about the importance of finding balance between the population level perspective and the raw emotional lived experience that fiction can evoke. Thanks very much, Jen. Thank you so much, Deb and Ty. It's really wonderful to be here and to be part of this conversation. Um, so just to give you a visual description, I am a white woman. I'm in my mid fifties. I use she, her pronouns. And um, my hair is, I guess I would call it pandemic pink. That's sort of what it looks like um, on the screen. It's very pink looking. I have, um, I'm wearing glasses. I'm sitting in my office on um, the Boston, the, the BU medical campus. So I am in the Crosstown neighborhood on the um, corner of Mass Ave and Albany Street. So one of the things about my background, so I've been teaching in the School of Public Health for 16 years. I have an, a master's in public health, but before that I did a PhD in English literature. And I spent some time um, while working on that PhD in English literature and then afterwards trying to figure out what to do with it. And then I sort of ended up going in what I thought was a completely different direction and studying public health. But now one of the things that I do here is I run our writing program. I've developed and run and I run the writing program here in the School of Public Health. And I'm always looking for ways to work books into our classes because most of the stuff that we read is articles and reports, um, articles from scientific journals. So this is um, one of my adventures with, with um, working, working books into to my class. And it's really the first time that I have um, brought a, a piece of fiction into a classroom. So I'm gonna share, I have some slides that I am going to share. Um, Okay, so um, as, um, as Deb mentioned, I teach a class called Global Mental Health, and it's a seven-week course in our um, Master's in Public Health program, and it's part of our Certificate in Mental Health and Substance Use. And one of the things that I think the thing I want to preface this talk by saying is that what I'm going to talk about is something that is, if you're teaching in a literature class, teaching a literature class, this is something you do every day. And it's something that I used to do every day. But to be honest, over the 16 years that I've worked here in the School of Public Health, I'd, I'd sort of lost the knack of. So I've been using fresh water in my mental health class for several years. And I think this year I finally came up with a system to really use it. And what I wanna do is kind of give you that system. Um, but just to give you a little bit of context. So before the sort of mid to early 2000s, global uh, mental health was not on the global health um, agenda really at all. And it wasn't until we started getting numbers from what is very widely known as the, um, the global burden of disease study. And we started to see just how big a toll mental illness takes on the lives of people around the world that um, the WHO and 
people all around the world started really taking this seriously. And actually Boston is a fantastic place for global mental health. Harvard has a very big program. Um, Boston Medical Center, the Department of Psychiatry has a fantastic program and I teach this little class. Um, and it's seven weeks to talk about mental health and mental illness and how, how, um, how culture inflects how we understand our experience. So um, the other thing I'll just point out is just this quote, because I think it's a really important one. Um, and so when it comes to mental health, all countries can be thought of as developing countries that we're all really far behind in terms of dealing with um, the mental health of our populations. But what I wanna be able to do is for students to see these numbers that a third of, um, of the years of life lived with disability um, are that, that that is created by depression and other forms of mental illness. I want them to kind of try to dive in and understand what that number means and also suspect it because, you know, how are we measuring something that is so defined by culture? So the, the novel. Um, so Ada is um, a baby who is born in the first pages. She is, we are told, born as an Obanje. And um, Akweke Ameze is a Nigerian author and an Obanje is um, from Igbo ontology and it is a trickster god, a malevolent trickster god who is born into the shape of a child. Um, so we watch Ada grow up and she experiences a number of traumas over the course of her young life. And so we're always wondering as we're, we're reading this novel, um, are these culturally mediated expressions of mental health, um, of trauma, of disassociative de identity disorder, resilience, what have you. So just to um, give you a couple of um, quotes, um, and I'm not gonna read both of them, but I'll, I'll quickly read the first, the second one. This is all ultimately a lit litany of madness. The colors of it, the sound it makes in heavy nights, the chirping of it across the shoulder of the morning. Think of the brief insanities that are in you, not just the ones that blossomed as you grew into taller, more sinful versions of yourself, but the ones you were born with tucked behind your liver. Take us for instance. And so that is the Obanje speaking there. Um, so, okay, so this is a six step process. And so we read this in the second week of the class and we really use it a touchstone for the rest of the course. Um, but that first time that we talk about it, I ask them to read the entire book and then I have them do some in-class writing. And I ask them to answer these questions um, and they're very kind of very specific questions like choose something in the book that spoke to you and then write one to three sentences about what is happening how does it connect with other aspects of the story? And how does it relate to topics we talked about last week in our first week of class um, and the reading, the other readings that you did for this week? Um, step two, I ask them to get into groups of three and read the passages out loud to one another. Um, what's happening? Again, um, how does it relate to the rest of the book? So they go around the circle and they each read their passage and they talk through it. Other people jump in with their reflections. They do this for the whole group. And then we come back and we talk about it. Um, step three, so we take a break. That takes quite a, quite a while. And that, that first group conversation really opens up a lot of possibilities for what this book can mean to us and how we can use it for the rest of the class. So then I ask them to go through the process together again. I ask them to, we put them in back into groups and I, we ask them to choose a passage randomly or by agreement so they can just open the book and put their finger down on a page or they can choose something and agree on it. And then um, something that is relatively short, one to five sentences. They're supposed to read it out loud and then very kind of methodically talk about who, what, where, when, why, how, what's going on here. And then how does it connect to other aspects of the story? And it's really important that everybody gets a chance to talk. So that's something that I really try to encourage. Um, and then step four is to go deeper. So um, I ask them to explore the passage through a theme of their choice that's relevant to the course. 
So some of the themes that have come up so far by this second second session are culture, illness, madness, health, adversity, resilience, coping, trauma, liminality, religion, God, being a God, being multiple, um, friends, trust, all sorts of things. Um, and then I ask them to go back to their passage and then talk about how that theme is playing out. So then the next step is to, and we, we do go through this sort of step by step, make connections about how the passage is playing out in the book um, and how we talked about it in class, conversations and other classes in your life with family, friends, the historical moment we're living in. We did this last semester um, at the, we, we started the class at the end of October and ended in December. So we were going through the election and there, there was a lot going on. So we were also able to bring that in. And then this interesting question of if Ada was your friend and she confided in you, what would you say to her? How would you encourage her? Interestingly, um, a lot of the students, because she is a difficult character um, and a difficult person said, I don't know if I could be friends with her, but you know, if I was, and if she came to me, this is you know, sort of how I would talk to her. So then we come back and we talk about how did this experience go? Did you end up seeing new things? Um, and we, we go through and we talk, we share the passages and we talk about them. And one of the things that inevitably comes up is that the students say, I really, I, the whole time I was reading and the whole time we've, we've been talking, I've been on the, the verge of saying that I want to diagnose her with disassociative identity disorder or something similar. You know, I want to diagnose her, but, but what this book is making me do is take a step back and realize that that might not be appropriate that might not be what's going on that that might shut down the conversation and that's really what i'm hoping for from this exercise so um as i told you earlier i got this um i sort of lost the knack for doing this and i taught this book two or three times before and never really knew exactly what to do with it or how to get into it then I started listening over the summer to a wonderful podcast called Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. Um, and they use this process. It's an ancient um, reading of divine text process called Lectio Divina to read chapters of Harry Potter in order and really dive into them. So I adapted that to this book. And um, so I highly recommend Freshwater. It's intense. Um, and I highly recommend Harry Potter and the Sacred, Te Sacred Text, which is less intense and a lot of fun and um, very educational in its own interesting way. So I will stop there so that we can hear from my fellow panelists. Deb, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. That just did not unmute as, as I wanted. But um, thank you so much, Jen, for that really interesting uh, entry into this conversation. And, you know, um, as Kat posted into the chat, you know, just giving us some ideas to think about in terms of approaches. Uh, so I, I just, uh, you know, we have time before we move on to our next presentation um, to open up for a couple of questions if people would like to ask Jen any specific questions now. I did have a, 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 a kind of a general question, actually, Jen, about um, just how you choose uh, works that you think will speak to, um, I guess, both both place uh, in the way that this spoke to to the sort of Nigerian experience, but it also opened it up for discussion that you made that, that students could then make connections to their own lives. So, how do you how do you think about choosing um, particular texts that can work in that way? Well, I have to be honest that it can be a little haphazard. So I had been looking for a book to do this for a long time. I'd been using some nonfiction books that just kind of weren't doing it, um, doing the trick. And then I heard a quick AMAZ on NPR one night and I just thought, this is it. This, this book is perfect. And to be completely honest, it's, it's a slender book. I, I really recommend it, but it's 
it's very beautifully written. It's very poetic, but it's intense and it's hard. And I have to say, I don't love it. I don't love reading it, you know, every year because it's just like, oh gosh. Um, but it students tend to love it. I do find though that I have to prepare them for it, um, you know, that I have to talk about the different kind of traumas that she is going to go through over the course of her life and give them lots of opportunities to, you know, say, I can't keep reading, I need to duck out of this conversation. So far, that actually hasn't happened. But I think that, that that's one of the that's, I think that's one of the difficulties or one of the challenges of using, um, you know, fiction and the arts is because it, it makes things that are, are very difficult, more real and more difficult in a lot of ways. So I, I, that, that needs to be handled carefully. And I'm sort of learning as I go with that. Thank you. And I think Carrie had a question, but Carrie, is, has, the, has your question been answered in the process? Well, you did answer my question, Jen. Um, you said most of the students love it. I was going to ask you about how you frame their investment of time in a novel. Um, I also have the experience of teaching mostly STEM-oriented students right now, and occasionally there's a lot of resistance to spending time of a class to what seems like just a novel. So I wonder if you run into that. I have in the past. I haven't with this book. Um, and I think students, when I, I send out early the email before the class even starts saying, I want you to get this novel and read it because it's going to be useful for all of our conversations. And I think it's because very specifically, I'm able to use it to open up this whole other part of the class, you know, where we talk about culture and we talk about individual experience. And I think the other thing, and maybe you experience this too, Carrie, with your students, is that at least in public health, a lot of our students, you know, they come to the School of Public Health because they want to do good, they want to change the world, and a lot of them have arts and, and the humanities in their background. So some of them are very STEM oriented and they have to be convinced that a novel is worth their while, but a lot of them are just like, wow, I get to read a novel for class. <laughs> and so that's really nice. Okay, thank you, Jen. Uh, and we'll, um, what we'll do now is we'll move on to our second presentation, but we can circle back to some of these questions, uh, you know, at the end of the presentation. So let me introduce Carrie Preston as our second presenter. And Carrie is the director of the Kilishan Honours College, a professor of English and women's gender and sexuality studies, and the founding co-director with Mohammed Zaman of the Initiative on Forced Displacement. Carrie will be discussing how she integrates the arts into classes that focused on forced migration, as well as how she builds lessons and assignments around arts events and experiences. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks so much, um, Deborah, and thanks, Ty, for organizing this event. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for taking some time in a busy semester, um, busy time of the semester, to have this conversation with us. Um, to give you a, a visual introduction, I'm here in my office on, at, at Kilichand Hall on Boston University's Charles River campus. I am a white woman with dirty blonde hair in my early 40s. In the parlance of our times, I will share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna give you three examples of arts that I use in classes on forced displacement um, and start with three reasons to use the arts in classes on forced displacement. Um, so like Jen, I have a graduate degree in English literature and a certificate in a graduate certificate in gender studies. Um, so I'm very familiar using the arts in typical English classes. Uh, but right now I'm teaching a big course on forced displacement and also organizing the curriculum at Kilichand Honors College, where, as I mentioned earlier, we have a majority of STEM students and we've had incredible success emphasizing the arts here. Um, so in the, the big course that all the honors students have to take, 
uh, an introduction to forced displacement or what I might think of as critical refugee studies, the area that I'm teaching in um, and also working in right now. I teach alongside professors of international relations, of course, anthropologists and engineers. But even without me present on a teaching team like that, I'm gonna argue for the inclusion of the arts um, for three general reasons. First of all, I think the arts help us engage differently, emotionally, and humanly. Um, they work at a question of scale. So you may have heard the numbers, 80 million people are forcibly displaced. It is very difficult to conceive of that number of people. Artworks engage the artist and the audience within a context of massive problems. So it, they give students a scale in some ways that, that they can think through. They allow us to celebrate the achievements. This is my number two. They allow us to celebrate the achievements of a culture, not just the displacement and suffering. And that's really crucial in a class like the one that I teach. Um, and the third reason is that we have an understandable tendency to rush to solutions to global problems like forced displacement. So we can, in that rush, end up reinforcing the status quo. Something like nation states exist, borders exist, nation states have a legal right and a compelling national interest to enforce those borders, to police those borders. And of course, we are quite familiar with the crisis at the US Southern border um, that is part of our status quo. Art can help us imagine new worlds totally different ways of organizing the world. One in which it's not just automatic that there are nation states and borders and the policing of them. Ways in which human mobility might be considered both a historical fact and a human right, um, rather than something to be managed and policed. Um, a way of thinking about gestures of hospitality, which also have a long history, instead of completely rights-based discourses that also aren't working very well for us. So arts help us imagine different possibilities. I'm gonna give you three examples. So this first one, I absolutely love. It's Ana Teresa Fernandez performance art, Erasing the Border, Borrando la Frontera, from first done in 2011, although then revived in different places and at different times. Um, so you can see here how she offered a different image of the migration regime by erasing, literally erasing the border. So here she is, this is the artist, Ana Teresa Fernandez. She's painting a section of the border fence separating Tijuana, Mexico and San Diego, California. She's armed with sky blue paint and dressed in a costume that is of course steeped in stereotypes of femininity. The students very easily pick up on, of course, the stiletto heels, the ubiquitous little black dress. Um, and, and she's painting a section of the border wall so that it blends into the sky. Um, at a certain moment, the authorities came to visit her and in some of her writing about this performance piece, she reflects on how that costume of femininity helped her in fact get away with the performance art piece because she seemed less dangerous in that particular costume. So she managed to, to get the police to allow her to um, continue her project. One of the other interesting things about her work is that she painted documentations of her work. So this is her painting, Erasing the Border, from 2013. So it allows, using a piece like this, allows us to move from performance to painted text. Um, here is one that I really like to use to analyze the costume and, and strategies of representing her own body, because you can see the, the skin, this is a close-up, one of the paintings is a close-up on her feet and those heels. Um, and you can see the skin sort of sagging into the heels, seeming to droop off her ankles and also um, paralleled by the folds in the sand. So you can talk about sort of strategies of the paint work. Um, and those steels to me 
parallel the lines of the fence digging into the sand. So she's suggesting here that our disastrous politics of migration are just steeped in both racism and misogyny. Other paintings documenting performance art work at the border, same location in, in Tijuana, show her sweeping the waves, um, so cleaning up the mess at the border and connected with women's work, women's labor. Um, one of the interesting things to think about is that the same, the same substance paint that she's using to paint the wall, she's using to create these other artworks, the, the paintings of the artworks, but in another costume, it would mean migrant labor painting a fence, right? So context, um, she's emphasizing. There's so many different lessons that we can use here. Um, she tells a great story about a runner coming down the beach and thinking that a section of that fence had fallen down. So here again, it's, it's the, this gap allows us to think entirely differently. What would the landscape look like? What would politics look like if we could erase the, the border fence? It, the gap or pause in the fence um, makes way for a new way of thinking about the world. Um, a little background on Fernanda, she was born in Mexico and immigrated with her family to San Diego at the age of 11. And she was first inspired, I just taught this a, a few weeks ago, um, and it was helpful to tell this story of changing administrations because she was first inspired to erase the border in 2011 when the Obama administration prohibited contact across the border wall at Tijuana, San Diego, the Friendship Park. Prior to that, families used to gather there to celebrate birthdays on either side of the fence or to sing songs or to connect. Um, so that was prohibited. Um, and she's repeated this performance, as I mentioned, at, at different moments. In, on April 9th, 2016, Fernandez coordinated a performance in the border cities of Mexicali, Agua Prieta, and Ciudad Juarez with volunteers and live streaming. So it was a collective three location performance um, done by communities. And that was, of course, shortly after Trump won the US presidency with slogans like build the wall. Um, and for many of our students with less of this history in their minds, they thought that it was Trump's border policies that were disastrous. And of course, now we're teaching this class and we're hearing about the crisis, the ongoing crisis. So it's helpful to say the change in administration does not change this problem. We need larger changes. We need deeper changes. Um, Another, so another way to really work with arts is to have students go to events. And Ty Furman's crew at the Arts Initiative has made it possible for, for all of our students to go to the ICA and MFA for free with their student IDs, which is wonderful. Um, in 2019, we used the ICA exhibit, When Home Won't Let You Stay, Migration Through Contemporary Art, as the foundation for our first year writing class. So students went to the exhibit, they got some background and did some reading about migration and forced displacement. They went to the exhibit, they were asked as one of their genre pieces to write a review of the exhibit. So they read some examples of arts reviews. And then um, we had a co-curricular event here at the Honors College um, where we got the chief curator, Eva Raspini, to come in and talk about the work of curation. And actually some of it, what was wonderful about this event was tremendous challenges thinking through the ethics of what was represented in a museum context, what was taken out of other contexts and presented as high art. It was a brilliant lecture. So the students, we really built the entire course around this exhibit, the issues it raised, and this opportunity to meet with the curator. And I urge so many of you to use the city of Boston. I find, you know, Eva Raspini gave this brilliant lecture um, and, and was really excited to be involved in the university. And every time I've reached out to folks in the city, they wanna be part of BU. Um, and then I hope some of you had the opportunity to uh, listen to the conversations with Teju Cole last week. 
In this course on forced displacement, I've been teaching Human Archipelago, um, the, the lovely book of photography um, with the photographer Fazal Sheikh, and, um, and then words by Teju Cole, although Teju Cole himself is an amazing photographer and art critic, as well as a novelist and essayist. Um, that first year writing course that I mentioned earlier, read several of his essays, including on mournable bodies and black body rereading James Baldwin's Stranger in the Village. And also in my class on forced displacement, we, we teach the, Teju Cole's provocative essay, The White Savior, Industrial Complex. Um, one of the great things about using Human Archipelago in our course is that it disrupts again genres of representing humanitarian crises. We're familiar with the child's face like this one, right next to the button, click to donate. Um, and we can talk about what photography does and some of the ethical complexities of photographing bodies, especially suffering bodies um, and, and their uses and set that alongside. So what is different about this photograph when it's positioned in a text like Human Archipelago, one of the things the students re really responded to um, that's amazing. Oh, and then so Human Archipelago, if you're not familiar with it, sets portraits of displaced people against um, landscapes like the one here that this is this is a destroyed Palestinian village that is shot from such distance that it almost looks beautiful. And these appear in the text. So you've got photograph and you've got Teju Cole's text. You have, you don't get a description of where the photograph is from, from. Often there are quotes, you don't also get a footnote to the quote. So as you read this book, you are forced to keep one finger in the notes on the photographs and then another finger on the notes about the text. And so there's this actually embodied engagement with the book as an artifact that as I'm you know, flipping through the book and I've got fingers in several different places, I'm doing this kind of finger gymnastics, I actually realize my own critical obsession with knowing who the photograph is of, where it was taken, what the, what the object I'm seeing from a distance is, and being asked to think differently about these images and the regime that constructs my desire to have these photographs placed. So there are several ways of reading. The one that Cole and Sheikh are recommending is to just engage with these people. And a lot of the text is about hospitality. So one of the ways that it facilitates conversation in the class is to think about gestures of hospitality, ancient values of hospitality against our rights-based discourse um, that isn't working super well for the refugee context. So there are ways of reading through these gestures and notes about hospitality and engaging with the images as images that don't require me to have that finger in the back of the book. And, and that's what I think um, they're challenging our desire to know and place. So I will stop there and, and take questions if you have them. Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, that was great to see those different examples. And, uh, you know, there were lots of different points that, that perhaps um, folks would like to pick up on. Uh, the thing that I think really struck me is the, the question of ethics and you know, these two things. Um, the immediacy of current events and, and how these um, how the arts can really help us engage uh, both intellectually but but emotionally and I think Jen kind of referred to that as well um, just you know how potentially confronting uh, those journeys might be and actually you know I, I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about that um, you know Jen was sort of opening up that question at the end of her response to your question of you know, how do you manage the, the difficulty uh, of uh, students confronting these, uh, you know, very complicated and, and difficult sort of scenes? Uh, so what are your thoughts on, on the emotional impact of integrating arts into your discussions? 
So I think that emotional impact is really, really important and crucial. And also, as Jen mentioned, really challenging for our students. So we prepare them as, as Jen suggested, um, even in the syllabus but before the first day that forced displacement is a topic that will make us uncomfortable. It should make us uncomfortable. Learning is often uncomfortable and we affirm that. Um, provide them with resources uh, should anyone find images or material we talk about triggering. We make ourselves very available for those conversations as well, but let them know what's available to them at BU. Um, and, and we have had students get upset and get frustrated with the, the constant sort of darkness of the class. But actually, while the arts can emphasize that darkness, we they also allow me to bring in beauty. So poetry that is beauty that we can analyze in class. Um, just last week, we did a, a wonderful poem by a Yemeni American, Threa Amantezer, um, called Heritage, Heritage Emissary. And we just, it, it wasn't about trauma, it was about moving cultures, and we just kind of gloried in the beauty of the poem. So arts do both for us. Um, and, you know, we, we have postdocs uh, and NTFs attached to the class as well. And we prepare them and try to prepare them and support them for the challenges they may face in, in this dealing with this material, but also with the students. Thank you, Carrie. Um, folks, any other questions specifically for Carrie at this point? Yeah, Holly, please go. You're mute, Holly. Holly, could you Holly, unmute you yourself, to... please? <laughs> it's important that someone do that every meeting. It's yeah. Really crucial. <laughs> All right. Um, I love the heft of that book you had. How do the students get their hands on that book? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. So I actually do a little bit of a bait and switch with them. They at first encounter it as a PDF, just the images and text. Hmm. And then I pass along the book. So they don't have those um, citations and they don't, they don't have the locations and identifying information about the photographs until later, until I show them and actually kind of gesture to my need to know how almost impossible it is for me to read the book without looking it all up um, and, and thinking through that reading strategy and other reading strategies. So I force them initially to encounter it as a PDF mm -hmm. um, and then pass out the book in class and have them look and see and try out the other, other strategies of reading. Yeah, okay. I actually don't make them buy it. Right, and and I was thinking um, more of this of the staying power with something that is actually physically so real, and not you know not that there are in not that it's an invention because it is in digital form, but that the originality of the physical object um, and just the sheer size of it you know, it's not, it won't go away on its own. It will not self-destruct on its own. Um, thank you for explaining. Yeah, it, it was an opportunity actually to talk through our dependence in the course on digital materials so as not to ask students to buy materials, uh, which they very much appreciate um, and how that gives access, but also what, it cuts away from the experience. Yeah. And that, that's not how uh, Teju Kola and Fazal Sheikh imagined that they would engage with the book at all. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Carrie, uh, and for the question too. Um, and I think we'll go on to our last presenter now to hear another perspective. And just a reminder, if you have questions, you can post them in the chat um, or raise your virtual hand uh, you know, the presenters are happy to take the questions along the way as well. 
So our final presenter, as I said, is David Kabaya. David is Assistant Provost for General Education, Professor of Archaeology and a specialist in Mesoamerican archaeology, focusing particularly on the pre-Hispanic civilizations of Central America, Central Mexico, sorry, David. Um, David will speak about arts integration for engaging the past, present and general education, moving from how he uses ancient art and art history in his teaching to his recent collaboration with the BU Arts Initiative on Hostile Terrain 94. He will also discuss other ways that art can be integrated into the hub undergraduate general education curriculum. And we're gonna talk about more about that hopefully as well. So thank you, David, over to you. Thanks Deb and Ty for organizing this and, and everyone who's on the call for, uh, for uh, tuning in. Um, I'm David, and uh, for a visual description, I'm, I'm in my sunroom, and it's, it is nice and sunny. I'm a white Hispanic male um, with brown hair that has a little more gray in it and the beard than um, my ego would like to admit, but that's middle age. So um, I, I'm uh, happy to talk about a few different elements of incorporating art into my teaching and then move back a little bit um, to consider arts in the hub. And, and that's where I hope that um, we'll get some feedback on how we could make the arts more impactful or, or what sorts of opportunities people have been um, leveraging with uh, the hub and, and teaching arts. So my own engagement um, in teaching in the arts, uh, well, I'll present a few different nested levels as a faculty in anthropology, archaeology, and Latin American studies. Um, and then my hat um, and involvement in the hub. So some of it's more of the specific curriculum, though I'm not going into the detail um, that uh, Carrie and Jen did with specific assignments, but just some of the themes that uh, I consider with students in my classes. Um, and so that includes being a Mesoamericanist, being an archeologist, having a little more of a social science background, but um, certainly aesthetic culture is uh, extremely important for understanding past peoples of the Americas. Um, and you know, so one issue that we come across in classes in archeology span is thinking about the colonialist roots of the discipline along with other allied disciplines like anthropology or art history um, and, uh, and how narratives about pre-Hispanic aesthetics uh, have been presented traditionally in the United States or in Western Europe. For instance, um, for much of the history of, of museums in the US and in Western Europe, uh, the Americas have been slotted within, you know, if there's sort of a, 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 a divide between, on the left, you see an American Museum of Natural History, AMNH, and on the right, the Met. Um, that, that uh, the cultures and the aesthetics of Eurasian cultures for a long time ended up in the Met, where, whereas those from the Americas, Africa, and Oceania ended up associated with natural history, with, with some explicit framing that these aesthetics and the people who created them were in some ways closer to nature and, and that they, they were grouped with dinosaurs and rock collections rather than high art. Now, I should say that that's changing and um, the Met has a fantastic curator uh, of the Americas and, and um, a good staff. And, and so they're, they're rethinking their Americas collections and display uh, over the next few years. Um, we also query aesthetics in terms of understanding social organization of past native peoples of the Americas. Um, and, you know, just as examples, so, you know, we have lots of different lines of evidence for uh, what were societies like, how were they more equal or inequal, unequal um, socially, what, what were the, the lines of uh, power and, and the axes of, um, of hierarchy within state level societies. But, but aesthetics helps us to flesh these out in different ways. So just as an example, you know, the two major culture areas of Mesoamerica, um, to the west you have on this simplified map, the Aztec Empire um, and other cultures of central Mexico, like where I work in Teotihuacan, um, where aesthetics were often very collective in nature. They're oriented to defining peoples and um, 
gods, the cosmic order, maintaining that cosmic order. Um, and you can see an image from an Aztec sculpture on the left, which uh, of course is what's on the flag of Mexico today. Whereas in other times in chapters in Mesoamerican history, um, art was much more exclusionary and was meant to separate uh, elites or the powerful from the rest. And so this lintel from uh, a relief panel from, from classic Maya culture just shows this outsized king compared to others in a, a culture that had a strong tradition of divine kingship during the classic period. Another way we can consider aesthetics in this world is um, in terms of the cultural violence that comes from the uh, antiquities trade and the, the loss of social knowledge, like from the last slide, when um, material uh, goods or material culture is in uh, private collections. And so just earlier this month, on the right, you can see uh, this mask from where I work in Teotihuacan um, that was sold for uh, over half a million dollars in France uh, in a Christie's auction. There was, um, this was part of a, a lot with other items from Mexico and there was outcry from from Mexico, but so far no change in, in you know, this sort of reselling of patrimony that has, has um, left the country decades ago. Um, but what we lose are, for instance, what's the social context of this particular aesthetics? Um, and uh, here the mask in the center is one that we were fortunate to find in our project in Teotihuacan in the south of the city. There's about 150 of these stone faces or masks that have been found for Teotihuacan and they're iconic of the art of the city, but really only about 10 of them have been excavated scientifically. And so as a result, we don't really know how they're used or there are sort of outlandish ideas um, of their use, including that they were um, used by only elites and that they were used in uh, as mortuary bundles. But the one that we found out in the south of the city was a non-elite resident, so it, it tells us something new. It tells us that that um, non-elites had access to these goods. Um, it wasn't in a mortuary context, and so uh, we know that that doesn't apply, at least in this case. Um, and in the little vitrine that you see on the left, um, the uh, pieces did tour LA and San Francisco and Phoenix um, for a Teotihuacan exhibit before returning to Mexico where they belong. Um, connecting a little more to issues of today and, and dovetailing nicely with, with what Kerry was just talking about, um, we think about the narratives of ethnogenesis and the movement of native peoples across what today are seen as, as hard political boundaries. So for instance, um, the Aztecs, the people we call Aztecs or the Mexica as the dominant ethnic group were part of uh, the largest uh, language family of, of the early Americas, Uto Aztecan, which spanned, as the name implies, from Utah, Northern California, down into uh, the farthest flung parts of the Nahua sphere and down into Nicaragua. And, and so people moved around these landscapes and we have their stories and we have their pictorial codices from the colonial period. So that brings us to um, what we're considering this last semester and ongoing in this semester, uh, which are border issues viewed through this work of public art um, called Hostile Terrain 94. And it's been a pleasure collaborating with the Arts Initiative on this. For those of you who haven't seen this, um, the BU's version of this um, exhibit, of which there are there were originally intended 94 of these because it's um, a statement of a, a policy of channeling people through the hostile um, terrain of the Sonoran Desert started in 1994. But now there's been about 150 of these uh, in different parts of the country and the world. Um, and it's commemorating the human toll of the over 3,000 people who've been documented. There are many other thousands whose remains have not been found um, as they've been channeled into these, uh, this hostile terrain. Um, and and this, uh, the, the um, project, I should say, is, um, was conceived by the Undocumented Migration Project, which is run by uh, my friend and colleague, Jason De Leon, who's at UCLA. And um, we ran it as a hub co-curricular last semester with uh, Eric Jarvis, who oversees the program in the hub. And it was a really nice learning experience um, just in terms of future potential uses. If, if there's an exhibit that you're interested in creating a co-curricular credited, hub credited experience for, we have the template that we would be happy to share if you get in touch with me or with Eric. 
um, of, of just having a certain amount of reflective exercises, some associated reading. Uh, for, for this particular one, we did individual and community, and we framed issues of how borders define communities, how migrants can live in two or more communities, their you know, new one in the United States, and how they keep ties to communities at home and process those sorts of issues. But there are other hub units um, that we could connect uh, to, um, uh, to different arts uh, um, integration into classes. And so students have been filling out tags that um, uh, uh, describe the remains, in some cases, the identification of names. So uh, the issues of emotional impact that we were just talking about, of course, certainly apply here um, as it's a, a heavy topic uh, to deal with. Um, moving just a little further back to my role um, in the hub, uh, you know, the hub, of course, is intended to be integrative through a student's career of four years of undergraduate within the major and outside the major. There are some units that might um, more uh, explicitly align with what we think of as arts education. For instance, there's a unit in aesthetic exploration that you see there, um, but also other outcomes like communicating in digital multimedia forms or creativity and innovation. A lot of arts um, uh, classes come out of there. So on the left, you can see where our numbers are right now in, of almost 1,700 courses in the hub right now, and where those different units um, in the hundreds of courses that are uh, available to students. So as we're you know, thinking about the hub and how it's working and, and doing faculty-led assessment, um, some of the issues that we're considering are, you know, what units do students like, which ones would they want to see more or less of, and we can do this through survey, we have a, a focus group of students that I work with, but at the level of departments and programs, thinking about um, how, how is the hub working in your particular unit, so for, for arts or aesthetically aligned uh, disciplines. What what is it like? I've I reached out to a few colleagues in in art history and CFA, and and some of them said uh, that um, you know they do see more uh, students without a background in aesthetics taking their courses, and you know this can pose certain challenges. But at the same time, you know they appreciate having uh, students from different disciplines in their uh, um, in their courses. But so thinking at, as a department, you know, what's it, how is this working for our majors and, and um, how, how is it working to have non-majors taking electives to fulfill requirements in this class? Is it diluting the content in some way? Should prerequisites be brought back in? These are all conversations we hope that units are having. And then at the, at the programmatic level, we're thinking about how um, is it working for schools and colleges and um, doing assessment of actual student work. In fact, this semester we're piloting DME, Digital Multimedia Expression, just to see what's out there, what are um, helpful assignments that we can promote to the broader community, how are the learning outcomes articulated, do they make sense, should we change them at all, um, and these are internal conversations that we're having in Hub Council, but we are looking for as much feedback as we can have um, from, from everyone in the BU community. Uh, and so I'll leave it there and to get any of that feedback you'd like. Thank you, David. Um, that was a really great to sort of think about those themes and also to think about how um, the, the arts can be inflected more broadly uh, in the general education courses. So folks, uh, I am gonna open up for general conversation now and I do invite you to, if you want to um, turn your, your cameras on so that we can get that sense of being around a, an actual seminar table, you know, in this new space. Um, I understand that uh, for, for different reasons, some of you may not be able to do that. Uh, does anyone have a question that they would like to put either to David or, uh, you know, to the, the panel as a whole? And please feel free just to... Um, Sorry, I have a dog in the room and she sounded like she was just going to bark. I was just about to mute myself just in case. Um, please feel free just to, uh, you know, unmute yourself and speak when we're in this uh, general discussion mode. I'll, I'll toss a, a broad one to all three of you. Um, if you can just share a little bit about maybe um, ways in which 
your work at Integrating the Arts um, has been received by your department, your chairs, your your colleagues within your discipline, um, and you know if there's been resistance, how do you approach that? Um, things like that. I'll chime in quickly. I mean, I think in our in in the archaeology program, everyone um, understands that we're connected to material culture and therefore visual culture and aesthetics, mm -hmm. um, and have close you know ties to art history and. Um, and and related disciplines like that. So no problems there, but something out of um, Jason de Leon's work, Archaeology Magazine is a popular magazine uh, you know, that um, uh, uh, reports on world archaeology and, and his work um, doing the hostile terrain and uh, documenting the landscape and materiality of migration in the southern border uh, as, as contemporary archaeology um, when that was presented in the magazine, did get some some very uh, vitriolic uh, letters written to the editor um, of this isn't real archaeology. This you know where you know where the pyramids and temples are you know that sort of um, antiquated vision of the discipline and and not being able to adapt to consider contemporary concerns in the way that I think the discipline is moving in. So I can kind of flip your comments Hi, um, My colleagues are not concerned about me using art, but they are concerned about certain justifications that would, for the use of art that would seem to suggest that the arts are a kind of um, handmaiden, if you will, to other concerns, like to major global problems like forced displacement. And I understand where that concern is coming from um, because the often it can seem as if the arts need that justification to exist or to be part of a university community. And so um, many of my colleagues want to make sure that there's also a place for pure artistic analysis without sort of ulterior motives of connecting it to grand problems in the world. I feel that both things can be happening at the same time. It's not an either or, um, but many of my colleagues in the arts fear an increasing emphasis on STEM fields. That's what they feel. And of course, um, fewer students majoring in the arts um, so and the humanities. So there's, there's that concern on the flip side of, of your question. And I simply try to affirm both and also um, speak to my colleagues about the value of bringing their work to students in a lot of different majors and that many will then come and take more classes with you, take other classes with you if you introduce this material and get them excited about the material. It offers access to the arts to a larger group of students. And we understand all of the, the cultural reasons, financial and economic reasons, um, parents' desires that steer students in certain directions. So we have to be willing to put our work in different directions um, to, to let students have access. So um, I can jump in and I guess the, the challenge that, that we face here in, in the School of Public Health and I think maybe the case in other um, sort of professional schools and graduate programs that are very, very tight. You know, they're tightly um, construed. We have, you know, the we have we're a competent competency based um, degree, and so every class that you have has to be mapped to this these competencies, and so you have to figure out sort of where that fits in. And I think one of the things that a lot of my colleagues who um, might be interested in bringing the arts into their classes um, struggle with or if you want to make the case if you're you know doing like a, a big core course is this there's a constant kind of tension between um, content which is you know what is I, I talked about years a lot years lived with disability what is one what is a year year of 
include with disability and how do you calculate it and what does it mean and what do we know about that in terms of all the other diseases in the world and so there we're always talking here about tools in your toolbox and like hard knowledge and so i don't want to be creating this false binary though that what i'm trying to do with um with this novel is not a skill for me it is a skill but i think that that there and this goes back to carrie's question this kind of perception may be more among students than among my colleagues and certainly my my dean dean um, sandra galea is very very supportive of this kind of thing um is just the perception that what we're talking about when if we're talking about a novel is not it's not a skill and you know to me i'm very busy trying to make the case that this is one of the most important skills that you'll get um, while you're here you can learn sas anywhere um or you, you know you can practice your your epidemiology equations but um you know you you can't leave this part of yourself behind either Thank you to all our speakers. Any, any other questions or comments that folks would like to open up? And, and I guess just to also remind, remind us, uh, going back to David's question of thinking about you know, arts integration into the hub more broadly, if you have thoughts or suggestions or questions about, about that. I have one, David. Um, actually, it might bring in Ty as well. What what support might be out there for faculty teaching hub courses or other courses because you know gen students aren't subject to the hub um, and we may have other faculty in the graduate schools and programs what support is there for faculty who want to stretch themselves and teach a novel in a class where a novel wouldn't generally appear or a performance art piece like i was showing so we, yeah, we do have a, a hub course enhancement fund, um, and the, they're not, not large, um, but um, Deb can probably correct me on this. They're <laughs> like maybe five hundred dollars something along that. Okay, um, um, and, and the, but then there are also stipends for course development, and so certainly like cert like you know we we would really like um, in the first few years of the hub we knew a lot of it would be just people um, refreshing their courses to align with their existing courses to align with the new learning outcomes that are in the hub. Um, but you know now we certainly would like to encourage overall new course development where there you know people are, are more purposefully um, engaging with the um, modes of inquiry and skill development that's in the hub and, and just rethinking the design of the course like, a backwards design to get to those particular outcomes, and so there that could you know be stipending um, for new course development. Um, uh, there is also, and, right. um, so I see Sandy Deacon Carr. I don't want to put you on the spot, Sandy, but we do the Cross College Challenge has a few. Um, it, nope. Yeah, great. Um, a few existing. Uh, connections with art. So there's one course that involves puppetry and CFA. I know that there's a developing Greek theater possible uh, cross college challenge. So that, I mean, that can be a way where if you, uh, so I mean, those of you who are already like well immersed in the arts, but then want to connect it to another discipline or you know project um, could develop a cross college challenge. Or if you're interested in the arts, but it's not your primary focus and you know you'd like to make a connection to someone in cfa or another art related um uh, department then this would be a good way of of making that pairing and there are also you know um uh, course development opportunities and stipends for that i don't know sandy if you want to add anything xcc related um uh, just to reiterate what you said in that xcc could be a nice place to bring you know the, the disciplines together. And so we could look to pair faculty um, with different backgrounds uh, to develop something new and interesting. And our courses are project-based. So really kind of students get a nice um, team experience with a hands-on type of project. Um, so we, you know, we've we've had a few that are that are arts focused, um, but we'd happy to be happy to explore um, 
you know, options that that faculty bring uh, toward thinking about new ideas as well. So. Yeah, and there we are trying to grow the program. So we're trying to you know, recruit more. We're, we're speaking with deans about having, you know, in college allocations and uh, we can stipend at some level from the hub budget as well. Uh, just to add, um, we do uh, have one grant opportunity that is exclusively for faculty. It's literally called the Arts Integration Grant. Um, so uh, similar to the hub grant, it is uh, up to $500 and it is designed exactly to support this sort of um, integrating some version of art into a course. So it's been used a variety of different ways. Sometimes it's for a stipend for an artist to do a class visit. Sometimes it's a museum or something that that we don't have a membership to that you know we want the students to engage with. So we'll cover the entrance fee, um, things like that. So there's a variety of ways in which that grant can be used. And I could uh, potentially add this uh, a fund that the CTL administers, um, which is for part time and full time lecturers. So not for tenured or tenure track folks, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, that's a, a professional development fund. And if there were uh, courses that you related to the arts that you were thinking about that you would like to integrate into your class, there would be support for you to do those courses. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. It's another angle. It's not so much uh, um, within the curriculum within the semester, it's probably a preparation for developing ideas. Um, but if there were related things that you wanted to learn to then bring into your class, there's definitely support for that as well. And I would just say, if anyone wanted to brainstorm exercises or activities, I really love talking about arts and how to bring it into different contexts. So reach out to me, I'll put my email in the chat. Actually, that's great, Carrie, because actually that's one of the questions I had, and I thought this kind of applies to all of you to some extent, but I think Carrie and David perhaps more, is that you seem to be developing uh, your ideas around things of the moment, you know, things that are happening now, um, and potentially, you know, exhibitions that are on now and so on. And I just wondered if you had any strategies to share with folks about how to manage the logistics of you know essentially creating either modules or courses on the go and, and and what are the sort of strategies to cut down time so that it you know um it, it's manageable for faculty do you want to start david <laughs> sure um i can just briefly with the co-curricular so i mean a co-curricular for the hub is intended at 60 total hours of work for students and so but that that includes in class meeting time and reading outside of class reflective exercises um, but it is substantial uh, and and so uh, thinking through how best to do that um, you know we worked fortunately we leaned on some great colleagues who came in and uh, suggested readings and and um, and and gave some guest talks. Ty came in, for instance, to talk about um, art, you know, as as uh, public facing art and or political art exhibits. And um, we have Jeff Rubin come in and talk about his migration issues and and others. So, um, so yeah, for a co curricular, since it is no earned credit, it's just the hub unit. Um, in in some ways, it's lighter. But for a faculty member, you're picking that up as sort of a quarter class, a half class on top of your your normal load. Um, but if you know, so you have to really want to see the the exhibit or or you know whatever your your whatever art related project you're trying to do um, come. And then it does give the incentive to students to sign up. So if you need, for instance, some um, assistance in assembly uh, or then presenting to peers. So I, that's one of the things we we found was very valuable is getting students to present what the exhibit means to them to their peers um, and and you know and, and we're going to have one more final processing I think at the end of this month with the student group. And I'll just quickly add that that's also a role that my office can play depending on the scenario and so with with hostile terrain and and David's co curricular um, what. Um, Dot and I managed was a, a lot of the communication about the exhibit, you know, we had the wall built for it um, and sort of managing the details of the of the practical exhibit. And so 
um, that's a piece that we can assist very much with and, and partner with faculty on. And I would say in response to Deb's question, I think a huge barrier is our obsession with expertise in the university. And there's good reason for expertise, but we have to, if, if we're dealing with an emerging crisis, we have to be able to say, I'm learning about this with you. We have to be able to say, I don't know when students ask us questions, how can we figure that out? And that's, a, that's scary. Um, earlier in my career, it would have been scarier, I think. But I'll, I'll say that in my experience, the class brightens up and livens up when I say, I don't know, how can we find out? And you engage students in your learning that way. Um, so I'll totally affirm that it's scary, but also that it can be really, really exciting to let yourself do that, to teach and really learn with students alongside them about a problem. Um, and I think we're just not trained as faculty to do that very well. Um, and so, you know, the, the practice in the mirror. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's figure it out. Um, and it can be really wonderful. It can really brighten up your teaching. That's a great point. I mean, I think it's, you know, BU being such a large place and an R1 where it's like, we know they're just pockets of expertise all over the place and we feel a little less comfortable than, you know, if we were teaching in a small liberal arts college and having to cover 50% of a discipline, you know, which would be more typical. We'd be, we're, we're more specialized, but um, the students don't need to know that. We, we know more. <laughs> I mean, we, 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 we have a base of knowledge that we can op approach questions openly with them and make learning a co-creative process. I can jump in just briefly and say that, you know, in public health where, you know, the COVID, the science is changing every day. And it's very stressful, no matter what you're sort of doing to be thinking, I have to be on top of everything that happens all the time, every day while I'm teaching this course. And so it, having something like um, a novel or a work of art that take, can take your attention away from the constantly evolving knowledge to say, okay, you know, how does this make me feel? What does this mean? How can it help me probe and understand this scary, difficult situation in a different way? I think it's it's nice to be able to take the attention away from that constant not knowing. So thank you so much. Um, I think those are all great answers to that question, but also touching on other things, the sort of importance of co-creating our learning uh, and the teachers being part of the process. Um, we are at the end, so I just want to thank our presenters for their time and for their thoughts, and hopefully we will continue the conversation at other times. Um, so, uh, folks, just, uh, you know, a general kind of thank you to our presenters. That was a really wonderful um, range of ideas. And I think I just want to hand over to Ty very briefly. He's got one announcement, and then we will formally close. Thank you. Yeah, just I dropped some links in the chat. Um, I, I encourage you, you know, part of what we do as well as the hub is build bridges. And so um, we have faculty from all, a whole bunch of disciplines on our council. Um, we have the, a bunch of grant opportunities, including I wanted to highlight um, Indigenous Voices in the Americas, where we're developing some programming um, throughout the entire year next year um, with um, could be up to a dozen different faculty in different disciplines. Um, and there is a pot of money um, for programming grants. And you know, um, all of these programs that we support are really meant to be deeply embedded within the, within the teaching um, and research of your discipline. And so please don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, folks, thanks. Thanks, Ty. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We appreciated the conversation. And again, thanks to Jen, Carrie, and David for their contributions. And we look forward to continuing the conversation another time. So stay well, everyone, and uh, see you soon, Bye, I hope. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care.